So um, I'm so glad to be here and uh, in front of you. It's just I'm so happy to be here and to go through this baby step process of going back to normal because I uh, personally uh, love being part of conferences. That's where I think that people should um, connect and link to each other even though they're just uh, maybe from different part of the world. So um, glad you're, take, you're um, taking some time and coming here. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, so my name is Andresa, um, and I know it's difficult to pronounce because it's an Albanian name. Um, I live in a place called Kosovo, and I'm a, I'm a software developer. Um, this place is based in the Balkans. It's um, in southeastern Europe, specifically. And you will see these two markers up there. Um, the red one up there, it's WeTech. It's our um, company, which is the business uh, which provides the software solutions to international customers. And they are web-based mostly. And the other one down there is Coder Girls, which is a community um, based in present in our hometown. Uh, we started this community like three or four years ago when we were part of our college days because it was so hard to travel like um, from a place to place to even be there physically on job interviews and other stuff or um, participate in uh, tech industry. So um, we started organizing events, hackathons, conferences, uh, based in open source, and uh, we try to um, have a glimpse uh, and gather people there in one place so they can know um, what this industry means and how important is open source. And yeah, the other speaker. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I think this one is working. Um, uh, so yeah, I am Albiona, I'm Chandresa's sister, and we are here together uh, to uh, attend the uh, Open Source Summit for the third time uh, uh, organized by the Linux Foundation. And we kind of started uh, super uh, basic three years ago. We were organizing events by Codegals and we were like studying and getting hands on the professional career. So uh, I am a DevRel and a full stack developer based in Kosovo. Uh, and uh, today uh, I think uh, we are good to go with our topic, but before that, you can find us on GitHub on the links that are here, and we can kind of start with the presentation. Yeah, sure. So um, today uh, we're going to talk more about the cloud native, and we will be focused on the cloud native architecture as a whole. Uh, we'll be continuing on cloud native services, uh, we'll be talking about serverless and um, what serverless means to us and how serverless has changed the way developers build applications. We'll continue talking about the uh, uh, serverless framework and um, we also included one of the um, function as a service providers here. So um, we're taking an example of that uh, later on. Um, we're also... Um, have, uh, we'll be having a glimpse of serverless anatomy uh, on our example, and by the end, we'll be able to see how to build a scalable API using serverless with some uh, basic configuration files and um, deploying it later on. You want to change it yourself? Yes. Okay, okay then. Uh, we will start off uh, with the fundamental into the cloud computing before continuing on the, let's say, the uh, best components when it comes to the cloud computing architecture. Um, cloud computing gives us uh, the option to have our IT infrastructure, uh, let's say, on the uh, uh, on based on somewhere else, kind of as a utility, and that's because. Uh, up until now or super late, uh, we were like handling everything ourselves and that means owning the servers and uh, managing the IT and of course the real estate for the servers. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the uh, utility or as a service, uh, having the uh, cloud computing uh, be 
uh, part of the different companies who are uh, who function as uh, providers to us it's basically easier uh, or it has different advantages on uh, computing or building up uh, different projects and that's uh, these are kind of three uh, basic or let's say overall uh, advantages of the cloud computing and those are the uh, lowering the total cost of ownership because uh, if we are kind of getting all of these services uh, from somewhere else uh, that means we will be focusing more on our business models and kind of providing the solutions to our clients and then the agility and the scale of, and performance uh, when it comes to the demand of our uh, users. Uh, we will uh, continue on the best parts of the, not best parts, but uh, the parts that we chose to talk today about the uh, cloud computing architecture, uh, but we will note some kind of uh, definitions from different resources, and one of them is the uh, Linux Foundation, where they put together this definition about cloud uh, native computing, which uses an open source software stack to uh, deploy applications uh, as microservices, uh, where each of the uh, part is uh, packaged and, uh, I'm sorry for the voice, where each of the parts is packaged into uh, containers uh, and that uh, goes uh, together with all of the uh, orchestrating all of these to manage the resources uh, or the utilization from these providers. Uh, we will focus on the containers, we will focus on the dynamic uh, orchestration and on the microservices uh, part. So um, the uh, Containers, when it comes to the containers, uh, they are packages of uh, software that uh, gives us, give, us, give us the opportunity to package our code and the dependencies and, and that we can, with, together with the container tool, we can run all of the things that we have in our application in, a, in any environment, uh, depending on the uh, depending on, uh, it depends on the tool that you are using or the uh, cloud service, let's say the private cloud or the uh, public storage and things like that. Um, when it comes to the, uh, yeah, let me just check something. So uh, when it comes to the containers, uh, the Docker uh, kind of uh, is a tool that provides you with the container uh, functionality and uh, they say that, let's say, uh, con the container is a standard uh, software tool that packages, uh, packages up the code and the, and the dependencies uh, so that the application can run qu quickly uh, on any environment or any computing environment. Uh, uh, in different parts uh, of the, uh, let's say, world. Uh, when it comes to uh, what they offer is that they offer this Docker uh, image, uh, which is a, a lightweight, a standalone uh, package uh, that uh, will provide you with all of the necessary things that you need to put up your application, and that is the code, the runtime, the system, uh, about the uh, libraries and the storage, uh, as well as the settings. Uh, the containers allow us uh, with their uh, lightweight packages to kind of uh, put together the code uh, with all of its dependencies and we can focus on the things such as the versioning of these dependencies and uh, the language runtime uh, uh, versions as well uh, that are required to set up and running your application anywhere. Uh, when it comes to the uh, differences between the containers and the other part that are the virtual machines that provide you kind of the same solution, uh, those differ a lot between because uh, containers are an abstraction uh, on top of the app uh, and that gives you the opportunity to work with just the code uh, and the dependencies, but the uh, operating system kernel layer is based there and you can use a lot of containers to uh, on top of that operating uh, system layer, and that means 
you'll have the opportunity to have more space or uh, have your package uh, super small to run it everywhere, whereas the virtual machines are, are an abstract uh, on the physical hardware uh, layer, and that uh, means that each, uh, let's say, package or container for virtual machines will have their own operating system, uh, the code, the dependencies, uh, and that makes it uh, super heavy uh, when it comes to the storage. So uh, the three uh, benefits for containers are the separation of responsibilities, and that comes up with dividing the teams of development and the IT, uh, where the development uh, team can focus on bringing up the functions or the features uh, uh, of the application, the logic part of it, uh, and uh, depending on the uh, IT, like depending on their own uh, requirements to meet the business logic side. And when it comes to the IT uh, team, uh, they can operate on their own to uh, set up all of the uh, necessary, uh, let's say, uh, uh, configurations so that this application can be up and running and they don't have to uh, kind of mix things up when it comes to the versioning and uh, other details. Uh, the workload uh, probability, it comes with the, let's say, containers can run anywhere globally and that means to the private uh, storages or to the public cloud providers or uh, your own uh, based a laptop uh, where you can set up the uh, uh, container and run it uh, everywhere. So it's like, uh, it's super easy for uh, developers to uh, set up and going with the application and to focus more on their uh, kind of uh, priorities. And then the application isolation, and that is about the container. Uh, containers visual, virtualize the uh, CPU, the memory, uh, storage, and network resources. And that makes it, uh, but it comes to the providing to the developers uh, with an overview of how the operating system logically is connected with everything. And then, we have the dynamic orchestration uh, that is uh, a pre-integrated solution that enables sov uh, service providers to launch out-of-the-box business logics uh, or business use cases uh, that leverages both the physical and the virtual network functions. Uh, these are all uh, come to one place of enabling the uh, quick uh, to time to market, focusing on the uh, optimizing the costs and providing the solutions to the target users that are uh, behind the scenes when it comes to the uh, solution itself. Uh, the components for the solution include the uh, VNF, uh, Virtual Network Functions Onboarding, that is uh, quickly onboard and validate multi-vendor uh, VNFs on the service provider environment. There is the end-to-end -end orchestration, element management, assurance, and the uh, and inventory. Uh, this is when it comes to the kind of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of services, let's say, or these setup out of the box business use cases can leverage each other's uh, services or features because they are uh, set up in a place where. Uh, uh, it's easier for them to be connected and kind of to uh, share the resources. And about the microservices. So the microservices are an uh, architectural approach to, to, to the development. Uh, when it comes to the uh, having all bits of the system set up, uh, it's like uh, every part of the function or of the application is set up into different services. And that means each service can have its uh, own team that is focused on uh, uh, prioritizing their uh, goals, let's say, or development feature, develop features uh, when it comes to their uh, kind of end uh, solution, uh, dividing the front end, back end, storage. All of these are uh, set up uh, on their own. It's like uh, small bits of projects that are connected into providing a bigger solution. Uh, arch this architecture makes applications easier to scale, uh, faster to develop, and enabling innovation and accelerating time uh, to market and for 
to, mar to market uh, for the new features. Uh, comparing it with the monolithic architecture and the microservices, the monolithic on the other side, it has all of the, uh, s let's say, uh, parts of the application together in one place, making it easier to, making it harder to scale because based on the new features, let's say, uh, it, uh, all of the code base will have to be changed uh, if it needs to be kind of another feature developed and uh, that is super uh, dependent on every part of it. Uh, it makes it a uh, super complex code base and it's uh, super hard later on to kind of uh, scale uh, in this way. And that's, that's where the microservice architecture comes in, where uh, the application is built based on the different components uh, that run each of their processes separately without depending on each other. Uh, and they are kind of connected with the lightweight, uh, super defined APIs to uh, send and receive, uh, let's say, uh, requirements from each of these services. Uh, we will go through the cloud uh, computing uh, types, starting with the uh, infrastructure as a service, then platform and function as a service uh, on the uh, cloud computing uh, providers. The infrastructure as a service, uh, so it offers the user uh, the option to use all of the uh, services when it comes to the networking and uh, storage and servers. Uh, basically, you will need to set up everything when it comes to the, your application and platforms and the infrastructure parties will, will, be, handling, will be handled by the uh, providers in this case. Uh, some of the advantages of it is that it, uh, the pay, you will have to pay what, you, you, what you're using when it comes to the computing part. Uh, it's uh, scaled uh, dynam dynam dynamically and uh, it has uh, a part of the security set up uh, because another part of it is not that because it uh, goes down to the uh, availability in this case because based on their own uh, uh, the way uh, how they work they will have to you will have to be kind of dependent on that side for the availability uh, the challenges are the lack of support from their uh, kind of teams uh, of these services. The uh, integration is kind of uh, complex and the processes do change because it depends based on their development uh, roadmaps. Uh, when it comes to the uh, platform as a service, uh, it is a cloud computing offering that uh, it uh, provides to you the uh, uh, the opportunity to set up all of your platform and application in this case to the cloud. Uh, it's, it comes up with a pre-built pre tools that uh, helps you to develop and uh, add new uh, features easily, let's say, and test these applications. Uh, it, in this side, when it comes to the advantages, they are, uh, they, they are cost, effect, cost effective, it's time savings because this way you will kind of have uh, it free to kind of build up a, an application idea that you have to see and test things out. And then uh, you have the security as well uh, that is increased and you have a flexibility to kind of uh, iterate through different uh, versions of the applications and platforms you are developing. And then the challenges of platform as a service, uh, there is a lot of security risks because it all depends on the cloud provider that you are kind of uh, using their services. Uh, you don't have to, you can't have uh, some kind of uh, hands-on to change things or to update things. It's the compatibility, the vendor dependency, and then risk of lock-in. Um, and to the other uh, type of cloud uh, computing uh, provider uh, service types is the function as a service, which is one of the most, uh, one of the famous uh, types of cloud computing because uh, it allows you to set up a uh, small building uh, code snippets uh, to kind of set up and running whenever you have events. Uh, and that is uh, super uh, cool because all of the other parts you will have to manage yourself. You don't need to depend on uh, about the computing storage and things like that from different uh, other services. In here, the advantages are that uh, 
you have improved the developer velocity, it's uh, built-in scalability depending on the usage of these uh, functions, it will uh, scale and the cost is efficient, is efficient because uh, whenever those functions are set up and are uh, used, they will, uh, you will get to pay only that time. Uh, the challenges are that it's less system control and it's a more complex complexity required for uh, testing. Um, it, this is uh, when it comes to the uh, types of cloud computing services uh, that we chose. And for the next part, uh, we will continue with the serverless. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Arjuna. So, um, uh, back in the day when we uh, tried to build applications, uh, we needed to take care of some processes uh, before going to the most exciting part, uh, writing the business logic. And we had to start on um, the bottom layer, which was the hardware layer, where the storage at the computer and everything was stored at. And then we needed to move to the um, uh, virtualization layer, which uh, in which we needed to have a single uh, running operating system, uh, but uh, we also uh, needed to um, create virtual machines to help it horizontally scale. The uh, upper, layer, upper layer would be the operating system, which I'm sure everybody knows uh, what this means to us, uh, to us and um, what this matters, um, which is the software that helps us uh, run the programs that we would need to work on. And the, I think the most important layer, which would be the runtime, um, because uh, this will, will help to put on work the operating system and the application layer. So um, um, after that one, uh, it comes the most exciting part that I was talking about earlier, the one where uh, we um, could write our business logic and we could uh, maybe form teams to uh, design, to build, and deploy these applications. So, um, based on this, all of this would have been like the exact process we would go through if you would um, plan to uh, work on an application which would maybe um, solve an existing problem. Uh, by that I mean, imagine you're working in a startup and you're trying to um, launch that product as soon as possible, but at the meantime, you're uh, like the um, uh, first person, you're doing all the uh, job in the background. By that I mean um, having to be, uh, to take care of your infrastructure, code, um, uh, management, sales, and everything else. So that's why um, uh, by this, um, they started to emerge some cloud services uh, by some uh, the some of the famous that we already know. Uh, let's say AWS because that's what we're using for our next example. Um, so they just started to um, focus more on making things efficient, uh, like the um, uh, services that Albiona mentioned. And uh, all of these um, networking and storage were just removed from an extra resources because they were already um, started to get some help from these uh, outsiders, from the cloud services providers. And then we started to just accomplish a more, um, maybe not manual way of uh, building those applications. Um, so um, all of these uh, services that we mentioned, the, um, the most uh, important one, I would say, maybe is the, uh, the last one, uh, function as a service, uh, which is um, uh, a kind of cloud computing service uh, that does not require coding to a particular framework or library. It's just um, a function um, that uh, lets you focus on that, and that function is just abstracts that application, and it makes you um, uh, build a, a individual component which makes the whole application. Um, so, uh, what's serverless bringing to the table? Um, I, I think that this is uh, uh, what makes it special because the deployment is very uh, different from the traditional system since we, uh, we do not have servers uh, 
server applications to run ourselves. It's just that we upload the code into one function and that uh, that function is being taken care of a service provider and then everything else is outsourced to somebody else and it just uh, continue to um, do everything else in the background, all the necessary things including provision, provisioning and other stuff. Um, so one th um, one, when we say that um, we include serverless into our applications, uh, sometimes we don't have a clear view of what that means, uh, uh, but we can focus on two main areas that uh, will um, explain better of that term. Uh, serverless, uh, when, we, when we hear of this word, it does not mean that it, not, it doesn't include servers in the background. It does actually, but what we understand is that someone else is uh, just taking care of that uh, in, uh, behind us. So um, another, uh, another term that would use to describe it is that serverless would be um, a third party um, cloud application and services. So we can manage the um, logic application like uh, single page web apps or mobile apps that have uh, cloud databases. Um, another one um, way uh, to think of this is the function as a service. Um, because as discussed earlier, uh, because uh, we do now we do have like many platforms that offer the service as you can see there's lambda function from AWS uh, Azure functions and Google function Google cloud functions um, so right now we will be uh, focusing more on the AWS lambda that's what we chose for the examples um, what's uh, actually uh, what's um, what uh, lambda does actually is just um, you can run a, co a code virtually on it. Um, it. It might be of any type of application or backend service. Um, each Lambda that you, that you create um, contains the code that you want to execute and everything else uh, that uh, happens in the background that we'll see later. So um, there are two ways that you can create them. Uh, you can use a WS console, uh, but uh, before doing that, you need to have uh, an AWS account with all its proper uh, credentials. So you can have a uh, proper function of the Lambda. And the other way of uh, creating it is, is through using serverless framework. Um, you could just can go uh, through the dashboard when you can create the function and just um, within your service and then continue to work on that. Or you can just use uh, the terminal um, uh, to log in through terminal with a single command in the serverless framework and then create that function that you want to just continue working on that. Um, so while we're here, um, we can see and we can like appreciate uh, how much a serverless framework is uh, helping us and uh, what is um, what is offering to us all of the um, things that uh, were explained earlier, such as defining your applications or your, or your functions and your events, uh, it's like too easy right now. Uh, deploying infrastructure, uh, it's too easy as well uh, with one line command. Or uh, using plugins that uh, would make your uh, code or your deploying like uh, very simple and many, many more which is offering right now. Um, so um, we will, um, jump right now into anatomy of serverless. Uh, so if you're thinking of uh, building an application which will include serverless um, within that, um, you would need, like it's a must that you would uh, include a serverless YAML file inside that application. And there's, um, I mean, there's a lot of the resources. So um, there's a file, it should be an, uh, a structure uh, to write on that file. Um, but some of them, uh, some of these attribu attributes are uh, a must. So um, uh, the project right here that uh, we're going to try is uh, uh, starting with the organization name. In this case, it's my name. And I was trying to build an e-commerce um, so I can include serverless in it. 
and uh, the app should be, uh, the app name should be um, included as well, which in this case is Jubilee Store, and the service name uh, should be included here. Um, we've talked about plugins that uh, we've um, if you would need to uh, like uh, make anything easy to deploy or to work on your application, you just include it in your serverless YAML file. In this case, it's uh, serverless offline that we needed to include. And also, um, the providers that we mentioned earlier, we um, used AWS uh, in this case. So we've included here name of the provider, runtime, uh, version, stage, uh, whether it's uh, development or production. Uh, region of that function that you've created it uh, in uh, that provider. And um, this one uh, right here is the role statements because I've uh, used DynamoDB uh, to store my data. So there's uh, some configuration steps to include that here. And also the environment variable, uh, which is my um, table name. Um, uh, so the functions that we've uh, talked until now, uh, you can just include them here as well. Uh, if there are some resources that you need to get or um, add the data, but uh, uh, in this case, um, uh, since the application will grow and um, it will just uh, the, make the code a mess, I've just uh, added it into a separate file, which is called jubilee.yaml and I've just included the uh, functions uh, right here. Also, I've included the resources um, uh, file here, which is the configuration of the data table, uh, the table that we're using on this example. And the last one should be uh, .env, because as I said, you need to have the um, proper credentials to um, create a function in AWS, so they would, have, uh, they would provide you the um, access key and secret, uh, secret access key and other stuff, uh, you can include them in your JS files or any, anywhere, but I just uh, added an NV file and I just uh, call them here. Um, so uh, this is one way of um, including uh, functions and events when you're trying to build an application with serverless. Um, so the file that I um, included here into the serverless is the same one which includes the resources here. And so I've, uh, I've just uh, added a screenshot with two of them. It's uh, add jewelry, which is the name of the function, and then the handler which um, uh, contains the uh, path of the, that method. And you can include the timeout. Uh, so the important part of that is the events. So you can have the HTTP uh, method and the path here. Uh, in this example, it should be a uh, post request with a path of jewelry. So the same thing goes for the other uh, function. It's just, uh, it does, it has another purpose by getting all jewelry that uh, we need. Um, so the other uh, picture is uh, a screenshot of the uh, resources file. Uh, so um, this part uh, maybe goes more with uh, DynamoDB um, structure, which I think maybe we should do another, sec another section of that, but it's just a little bit um, uh, a basic structure where you could have the name, the type, and the um, properties with a partition key and a sort key of that table, and of course the name of that table. Um, this is the way of, um, so this is a method that we've used um, where we could uh, call the lambda um, function and uh, a way we defined uh, a method where we could just get an item and uh, return the result or uh, even uh, the message if it fails. So it's just a basic one we would use everywhere. Um, so right now, uh, let's see. I have an example here, uh, which I made it beforehand because of the sake of the time. So uh, all of the picture you saw until now, it's based on this project, which is a public repository and my GitHub, you can find it there. If you wanna build an application and you want to just set up uh, serverless, uh, it's easy and it's like a boilerplate, it just, you can use it and 
you can just add more features on it if you want to. So there's an SRC directory where I store my services and utils. Uh, and inside the utils, I store my um, response um, messages and the credentials. Uh, and I call the uh, file with the AWS credentials. This is the service where I store my resources. And uh, the most important part is the serverless um, folder where I include my functions and then all, all of these functions are um, called here in the serverless YAML file. Um, so right now what uh, I'm trying to do is that I should be, um, these right here would be um, uh, basic CRUD uh, functionality where we would be able to add, edit, uh, delete, or um, um, get uh, some data uh, for this uh, project. But uh, what, I, uh, what I have not included here is the get uh, method. So we're going to do it right now. I'm just going to copy and paste it right here. So we can see it, what happens. And this is the place. Okay, this should be in my service, right in the cat here. And uh, so this should be a basic function to get all of the uh, properties here. Okay, this is. This should be the proper way. Um, now that we've added everything we've needed, we can just go and uh, write this simple command to uh, deploy the changes that we made. I hope that everything will go as planned. <laughs> um, so right now, uh, it's doing all of the stuff that we've discussed until now. In the background, it's just continuing to deploy um, these resources and so we can try them and test them um, how this works like internally. Um, while we're here, uh, what I, I can show you what I did. So I opened um, an account as I've said, I think we should fix the region here is US East okay so I've uh, used DynamoDB to store my data and I've added a table here which you can see it's named serverless presentation example um, and we can view the items here so I've ha I had uh, at the moment like three products uh, one of them should be um, Yes, one of them should be this one because I've added it like before, five minutes before the presentation, and its name should be Linux. Um, now, uh, we already have all the resources to um, test this CRUD functionality. Um, we've added just the uh, get method. Okay, I think uh, it's done. So maybe we can try it here in the terminal, but you can try it uh, using any tool you want, like Postman or uh, Insomnia. Uh, I'll try it here and see if it uh, returns my data. Yeah, it's here. So every um, um, so the whole object is here, as you can see it, and in uh, DynamoDB, and um, it's working. So it's just. Um, a simple, a very simple um, step to deploy uh, your application and test it, and then uh, see if everything uh, goes as planned. Um, so I'm continuing on this slide. Um, so based on that, uh, uh, we need to do a more debugging. Uh, when uh, it comes to that, but based on community and uh, lots of developers, there's uh, a lack of uh, uh, resources when it comes to debugging because uh, what Lambda uh, returns you, there are, there are many times there are 
uh, errors uh, when you just cannot understand those information, but it still depends on the type of error you get. So if you get a syntax error, maybe you could just enable uh, serverless debug and then continue using that. But if you get another uh, error, it just depends um, on what tool you're using or um, what the kind of error that is. Another way of monitoring them is uh, using AWS uh, console. So you have, um, there's Cloud, uh, CloudWatch there, and it's a platform, it's a actually very uh, powerful platform where you could see um, a, a way of, um, a, a visualized way actually, um, all of your uh, um, data, all of your uh, logs uh, there so you can um, kind of get a hint what's going uh, wrong or if it's working properly and things like that. Um, this, uh, what you're seeing on the screen is uh, the dashboard of uh, serverless framework uh, where uh, you, you also can uh, use it as a debugging tool. Um, right now uh, I'm seeing my um, um, a dashboard for my service and you just can um, use it for different purposes like I've, I, I wanted to know more about the uh, API requests and errors in the period of time for example for the last seven days and yeah it's super helpful. So um, I know we've talked a lot about um, uh, serverless and the benefits that you could have by uh, using it and including it in your applications. But um, uh, there are drawbacks and challenges as well when you try to uh, work with that. So s some of that you can see on the screen, but there are many of that, many of them that um, they are not included here. Um, uh, let's say vendor lock-in. So um, when we say that uh, we use a service provider to help us do all of the things in the background, um, uh, we just put our uh, uh, faith in that and just we just play by their rules. So it's one of the challenges and one of the cons maybe that we have to deal with it uh, when we start to or when we decide to include serverless in our applications. Um, another maybe uh, cons that would be is that if your uh, application, um, it, uh, it's uh, part of your um, AWS uh, service provider, it's not that easy to just um, uh, port your application to Azure, let's say, or another uh, cloud service provider. So that's uh, one of the cons that I would say it matters. And like anything else in technology, we must uh, consider the security factor because um, when it comes to serverless, uh, as I said about the um, uh, vendor lock-in, it goes the same thing with the security. Everything falls under the uh, um, cloud service provider and not the consumer. And uh, also, despite all of the documentation and the community and other stuff, um, it's, it's still hard to um, find the learning curve that you need for uh, to, to maybe uh, migrate or to start something from scratch using serverless because it's quite a challenge to um, uh, work on that and start uh, doing things with that. And many, many other things like uh, you, you would need to have a significant, significant mindset shift. Uh, and it's also like the um, every, every time would be the lack of local testing options, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, and many, many things. Uh, so yeah, um, these are some references that we've used to um, work on, on this presentation. Um, so this presentation is uploaded on Sketch. I would um, kindly uh, invite you guys to view it because uh, the first links are very important to us and I will uh, uh, show you what we're doing in Kosovo and how important open source is to us and what we're trying to build. You can see them all there. And uh, the uh, links down there, there are presentation resources that we've um, used to uh, work on this and um, 
to um, build this application or this presentation that we would present today. So um, yeah, this is it and you're welcome to um, ask questions if you have any and um, talk to us for everything that you need. Thank you for your participa participation. We really appreciate uh, you taking um, your time to get here, so thanks. Oh, we're also, uh, as, we're, as I said, that uh, we're trying to go back uh, to normal. We also won the bid to uh, organize Debian conference in Kosovo. It's the first time that it's being organized in a country in the Balkans, or in Europe at least, because uh, they already choose the places, um, Eastern or uh, somewhere up there. So um, if you're a fan of open, so of open source and you wanna uh, know more about Debian, uh, we're also contributed to that part, so you can uh, come there next year and um, or talk to us and we can help you. So yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Like, like I think. Yeah. Um. I don't really have much experience using other cloud services. Um. I've uh, read something about uh, uh, the 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 company that I've used to work with. They used um Google. Uh, functions and uh, they are basically like uh, they had the same issues um, as uh, we have, as you would have in AWS or another uh, like cloud service. Um, it's just uh, maybe um, uh, AWS would uh, it has actually the best documentation uh, that you would need to work on with that and to uh, maybe. Uh, develop that application using serverless because um, it has even the community it's very like um, sophisticated they just um, um, uh, they uh, hold events they organize uh, um, uh, talks about how can you set up a uh, lambda function and how can you use it with other applications and stuff but yeah I, I think I think it's uh, basically the same issues in all of the uh, cloud services providers. Thank you. Yeah, I actually have uh, one of that here uh, in my um, In my links here, uh, I think it's called only serverless, serverless architectures with AWS Lambda. I can share it with you too. Um, it's one of that, uh, it's also, um, uh, I don't know the author of that, but it's about the microservices and cloud, uh, cloud native. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the link. So uh, it just describes in details how can you, um, use this and how can you approach uh, build uh, the way of building uh, uh, applications using serverless. Um, the other one I've used, I mean, no, the other one, uh, it's uh, more of for the DynamoDB, it's by Alex Debris, um, um, the DynamoDB book. But yeah, I can share some of that with, with you. So there, um, pretty detailed. Yes, but yes, um, some of these are the main ones that I've used. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, nice. Okay, so if uh, anyone doesn't have any questions, just can call it an end. So thank you again, and um, 
Let's be in touch.